Uh, and, and I can take over from there, okay? We do that. So very good uh, morning or afternoon, dear colleagues, uh, dear students, uh, dear friends. It's really uh, a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you to uh, one of those uh, EU plant events, uh, an event co-organized by the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at the University of Leuven and uh, the School of Law at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, this event on EU-China cross-border judicial cooperation with BI countries is organized in the context of the Jean Monnet Network on EU-China legal and judicial cooperation, a network whose activities will soon end in the sense that our uh, uh, funding will uh, terminate at the end of this month. So this is really one of the last events of a very long series of events to which have contributed a number of European and Chinese institutions. And I'm therefore very pleased to see a number of the principal investigators uh, of that project here uh, in the room, a project which was bringing together indeed Queen Mary University of London, King's College London, Erasmus University Rotterdam, the University of Leuven, the University of Bologna, City University of Hong Kong, uh, Bei Shada, Beijing Normal University, and Tsinghua uh, University. So, um, Again, a very warm welcome to all of you and all my gratitude to uh, the speakers for having made this event also possible. And also all my gratitude, obviously, to you, Julien, for having kindly, share, uh, kindly agreed to share this event and also, also for your availability to contribute to so many of the activities of this network since uh, its start in uh, 2019. Um, let me pass you the floor, Julien. You are in command. Well. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mathieu. So, so very good morning, afternoon, everyone, to uh, one and all present uh, here. Uh, I have the pleasure to chair this EU plan panel on EU-China judicial cooperation, which will focus on cross-border judicial cooperation with BRI countries. So in the next um, two or three minutes of my very brief uh, introduction remarks, I'll be uh, walking you through what uh, this panel is about, how useful uh, we hope it is for, for you, and what does the, the future hold in the context of uh, the theme of this panel. Well, I think uh, the theme of this webinar reflects the, the growing recognition of the, um, I would say, the, the power and importance of China in international relations and international business, and the vital role law and arbitration play in shaping economic governance. So as many of you may know, uh, since its introduction, the BRI has uh, yielded uh, fruitful outcomes, embracing many countries, many new regions, and uh, beyond um, the, the, what was the initial BRI, um, this, this initiative is now covering many sectors, including energy, transportation, information, finance, and so on. So in addition, the launch of the, the so many projects under the BRI makes, I think the initiative a key device for China and those countries to engage in global cooperation, improve global economic governance, also promote uh, common development and prosperity worldwide and, and push at the end for the building of a community with a shared future uh, for mankind. So for all these reasons, the BRI creates both opportunities and risks in a large number of sectors and industries. Um, and for these reasons too, uh, disputes um, resolution and the dialogue across jurisdictions is a very, very important topic. So of course, there are many challenges, and a number of uncertain solutions or directions, I should say. In fact, the, the central idea for this panel is to discuss from various perspectives the, the many BRI challenges in terms of cross-border judicial cooperations with uh, BRI countries. In order to discuss these issues and concerns, which are important for the future of uh, dispute resolution. I'm delighted to welcome all the distinguished participants. So for today's 
EU plans uh, webinar, I have the pleasure to welcome four experts, namely Dr. Matthew Airy uh, from Oxford University, Professor Lee Yuen from Erasmus um, University of Rotterdam, Professor Li Bin from Beijing Normal University, and Professor Susan Finder from Peking University. So uh, we are going to listen to them. Matthew Yeri will speak about Chinese law and development, focusing on networks, institutions, and practices. Uh, Susan Finder will discuss the, the role of the Supreme Court and BRI dispute resolution. We'll have a little break after these two presentations with questions and, and answers. And then in a kind of second session, we will uh, continue with UN Lee, focusing on Chinese uh, foreign investment law and the new uh, law that is in place for, for now a few months. And we will close with uh, Li Bin discussing the uh, impact of the RCEP, so the Regional Conference of Economic Partnership um, and its impacts on the, the BR. So I thank uh, very much these uh, four presenters who have joined to, to share their knowledge and experience and will ensure that the discussion is grounded in the concrete realities of Chinese comparative law and international dispute resolution. Before closing, before coming to a close of these remarks, I would also like to remind you to strictly stick to our uh, time schedule. So there should be 20 minutes maximum for each uh, speaker so that we do not let the panel overrun. Uh, for all of you in attendance, I sincerely hope you will enjoy today's debate. Thank you for your participation. And I now hand over the floor to our first speaker, um, Matthew Airy. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Professor Chase. Uh, I, I didn't know if Professor Finder wanted to go first. Uh, Susan, I wanted to give you the floor in case you wanted yeah. to go first, given your Yeah, I, know. I think, I, actually, I think it makes sense for me to go first, because some of the things, because I'm, some of the Okay, things... so let's change, and Susan, you go first. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Hold on a second here. Oh, yeah, give me a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I'll talk about the Supreme People's Court, or the SPC for short, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, some people may know that um, on the China Internet, so the China International Commercial Court um, is it, uh, expert committee, it's, but nothing I say in this presentation should be attributed either to the Supreme People's Court or the expert committee. I, this is, you know, me wearing my academic hat. Um, so the roadmap, uh, talk a tiny bit about uh, BRI and um, EPC contractors, because that's a lot of the business under BRI. Then talk about the link between the Supreme People's Court and BRI and a very quick introduction to the Supreme People's Court for those people who need a very brief introduction. Uh, principal BRI policy and guidance documents and then talk about uh, Supreme People's Court support for Belt and Road dispute resolution, and then kind of what, what to expect uh, going forward. Yeah, so this is a very schematic, you know, so it's a, it's a picture of um, like EPC contracting, so very basic. So underlying this chart is are a lot of contracts uh, governed by different types of law, different uh, dis uh, dispute resolution clauses, generally project specific. Uh, there's a kind of a form contract um, called FIDIC, which has a lot of 
which is often used in these kind of contracts. Um, so, so, so there are loan contracts uh, very often uh, guarantees to ensure, for example, the Chinese EPC contractor uh, does uh, perform his obligations, et cetera, et cetera. So very often a Chinese contractor will hire um, a Chinese company to do engineering. Uh, there'll be supply procurement will be by, by Chinese companies, et cetera. So you'll have a mix of both foreign law and Chinese law, Chinese court, Chinese arbitration, and very often offshore arbitration uh, for, the, for, the, for the EPC contractor, for the contract between the EPC contractor and the, the owner of the project. So the BRI, the BRI law, law, you know, commercial deals are, are very often quite, uh, quite complicated. Uh, so, okay, I mean, this domestic and foreign related legal infrastructure needs to keep pace with China's place in the world. This is actually kind of a rewrite of uh, a bit of Xi Jinping uh, rule of law thought. Um, as China has gotten into BRI, within China it was realized that both domestic and foreign related legal infrastructure needed to improve for, for the reasons I talked about a minute ago that these deals involve both domestic contracts and foreign related contracts. The Supreme People's Court uh, under the Chinese system needs to do its part concerning both substantive and procedural law. Um, it, in the Chinese system, you know, among the Chinese legal community is generally recognized Chinese law, national law lags behind and is insufficiently detailed. So one substantive law example is this um, provisions of the Supreme Court on adjudicating independent guarantee cases, which is very important to all the guarantees related to the previous slide. So, and this, the Supreme People's Court issued uh, shortly after the, shortly after the um, BRI started, uh, consulting with the International Chamber of Commerce, the Chinese PBOC, so the Chinese banking authorities, et cetera, et cetera. So from this, you can get a chance, get a sense that the Chinese Supreme People's Court acts differently from some from Supreme Courts in other jurisdictions. Yeah, so this is, it was then Luo Dongchuan, who was, uh, I would say kind of the, I don't want to say the principal, he, he was uh, guiding the drafting one of the policy documents uh, I talked about. So he, he said when it, the first policy document was announced that so in accordance with the requirements of the party center, um, so the courts have assumed an important function of providing judicial services and safeguards for the Belgian road. And is an important and indispensable force for the rule of law construction. And so the idea is that the, Supreme, the, the courts ser serve the Belgian road in helping on the legal side. So this is a one or two minute introduction. So this is the main building of the Supreme People's Court. Uh, this is their um, structure chart. The China International Commercial Court is linked to the Civil Adjudication Tribunal number four. Those are, um, yeah, so the English, um, you can get a sense from all these, of, you know, from the entities here, so it looks like a cross between a bureaucracy and a court, and, and, and that, is, that is right.
let's see. Next. Yeah, so these are the international, uh, China International Commercial Court judges. I get, these are the people behind a lot of the document, drafting a lot of the documents I'll talk about. So these are the leading Supreme People's Court international commercial and maritime experts. So the Judge Wang Shumei is the head, is the current head of the Supreme People's Court number four civil division. Um, yeah, so yeah, so you, you, you have some faces behind behind the institution. Yeah, so how, how does the Supreme People's Court support the BRI through these, these functions? So creating judicial policy, I'll talk about that in a minute, hearing cases, creating what I call quasi-legislation like that, interpretation about uh, guarantees, guiding the lower courts, administering the lower courts, cooperating with other institutions as in with the drafting of that interpretation and promoting the soft power of Chinese law and the Chinese courts. So that last bullet point is, you know, I'm allocating to Matthew. Uh, yeah, so these, so there are four principal BRI policy and guidance documents. So this went from July, so, summer of 2015, uh, 2019, 2020. And then there was uh, one issue. So it was issued in January, but it was dated the end of 2021. So the one through three, the more kind of links between party and state policy and the law. This number, this last one is much guidance for judges. Um, much more a collection of legal rules. Yeah, so I'm going to zip through the, what the Supreme Field Court is doing in uh, BRI dispute resolutions. So yeah, so some measures are BRI specific and really most of them are not. Uh, yes, yeah, so the big uh, focus in arbitration because it's the normal way of resolving China related disputes and, you know, just international commercial disputes generally. So BRI means many more cross border disputes. The Supreme People's Court has a big body of what are called interpretations, quasi legislation filling in gaps in the Chinese arbitration law concerning judicial review of arbitration. And there's a special review mechanism uh, when lower courts make rulings about related to arbitration. So the Supreme People's Court has a policy, stated policy objective to be arbitration friendly. Uh, so what have they done? Um, so they've issued these two, there are these two quasi-legislative developments, a notice from uh, 2017 flagged in the first policy document and that these three 2017-2018 interpretations, um, kind of regular, you know, putting together principles on judicial review of arbitration that was also flagged in that 2015 policy document. Uh, yeah, so then what, what else are they doing? There are special measures for Hong Kong arbitration. In particular, uh, there's an arrangement for arbitration interim measures. So before your arbitration is, is um, over, this, this enables a party to freeze assets, et cetera. That's what the interim measures are. So Supreme People's Court is supporting over overseas arbitration institutes to set up offices or to set up case offices in China. You have the China Inter International Commercial Court filling in gaps in Chinese arbitration law. Um, and the Supreme People's Court contributing to the amendment of the arbitration law. The Ministry of Justice is doing a draft uh, and they're 
draft put out for, for public comment mentioned, you know, many thanks to the Supreme People's Court and the lower courts for, for, their, for their help. Uh, so on to litigation. So this is, you know, good, uh, good for a thesis or academic. there are lots and lots of interesting articles involving civil procedure, private international law, public international law. Uh, the BRI opinions flag new policy concerning enforcement of foreign judgments, which had traditionally been super hard, uh, using the reciprocity requirement. The last, the guidance I mentioned has set out some procedures. Um, so another theme is Supreme People's Court judges strengthening the voice of China in formulating international rules. Uh, you'll see the next photo. And then China has signed the uh, Choice of Courts Convention uh, and has not, has not ratified, um, but hasn't ratified it yet. Yeah, so in this photo, first, first row, the second gentleman from the left is Judge Xi Yang. So he participated, in, so he was part of the Chinese delegation uh, negotiating the judgments convention. Yes, yeah, so other developments, yeah, the China International Commercial Court, uh, then there's online, China is very active in establishing online courts and now it's looking to have them be more active cross-border. Uh, yeah, so the Supreme People's Court also working with the Ministry of Foreign, Air, Foreign Affairs to expand its network of enforcement of judgments and other civil uh, legal assistance treaties, especially with Belt and Road countries, also flagged in the policy documents I mentioned. Uh, yeah, so there's a pilot on related to bankruptcy law. There's an interest in cross border bankruptcy enforcement. Uh, Supreme People's Court input, you know, providing input to other legislation. Yeah, so I've met, mentioned the conference summary. Hold on, on to, yeah, so this is, you know, a, a, a let's see, then on to mediation. So the, all these opinions I mentioned have language about divert, what, what is called diversified dispute resolution and settling disputes through mediation. Also promoted by the CICC rules. Um, yeah, there's a mention of link to Hong Kong mediation in the CICC one-stop platform, but that's not there yet. Uh, so, China signed the Singapore Mediation Convention and the SPC was involved in the decision. Uh, so not yet ratified. It has to do with the state of Chinese mediation legislation and the kind of mediation infrastructure. Uh, and yes, yeah, so just to note, so Chinese contractor experiencing international commercial mediation in a lot of the BRI construction contracts. Whoops. Um, yeah, so this is, you'll see me. Yeah, so I'm here in this photo. This was a pre-Singapore mediation convention discussion. Um, so where a lot of the players were in the same room discuss. So there's, um, uh, the gentleman to my right is um, Mr. Wen Chen Tao from the Ministry of Commerce, who is a principal Chinese negotiator for the Singapore Mediation Convention. So he, he and a couple other people in the photo and I are friends and we had this idea to put everybody in the same room to discuss you know, the, the issues related to signing the Singapore Mediation Convention. So of course, this is all pre, pre COVID. Uh, that's uh, the, the other white guy in the room uh, is um, a Adrian Hughes, a QC. He and I happened to be in Beijing for a few days 
for another event. And so Adrian does a lot of construction, arbitration, mediation. I thought it'd be really good for him to talk about what it's what it's like in 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 practice. Uh, yeah. So what can so what can we expect going forward? So some only some of the things involve the Supreme People's Court's case hearing function. So I think we'll see the Chinese courts engaging with the outside world more robustly. Um, so we'll, the Supreme People's Court will be, can, continue to participate in Chinese delegations, negotiating international rules, more engagement with international institutions and foreign judiciaries. But I think, you know, that's with Matthew. Um, you know, so including more treaties and conventions. On the domestic side, uh, the Supreme People's Court will contribute to creating appropriate domestic institutions and special legislation to, um, to have legislation that more, that better can be applied abroad or um, is better harmonized with the outside world. Yeah, so the Supreme Court will, will be participating in creating a body of Chinese legal norms related to interacting with the rest of the world, substantively and procedurally. I think we're likely to hear more, the Chinese courts are likely to hear more foreign related cases, um, but they're a teeny tiny number, you know, like, 23,000 out of 30 million in the Chinese course. Uh, the Supreme People's Court is still considering the proper role for the CICC. And I see the Supreme People's Court will participate in the harmonization of Chinese law practice, law with the rest of the world. Yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so useful resources. I highly recommend this book here, the Belt and Road Initiative book. Uh, it has a lot of cases and a lot of insights, you know, from top uh, top lawyers advising these Chinese engineering contractors. So yeah, so thank you for your time, and I look look forward to discussing more. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne, for for giving us uh, an insightful presentation. I will have questions. I see that some questions are already coming in, but I keep them for the for the Q and A after Matthew's presentation. Okay, I just want to remind all those in attendance, more than 60, 70 people now, that they should feel free to use the chat box to ask questions now. You don't have to wait the, the Q and A time. It's easier for for us, for me, to collect questions during the presentations. So I I think that. Um, um, many important themes emerge from, from your presentation, Suzanne, uh, which I suggest using to, to continue the rest of the discussion with our next panelist. So let me turn to um, Matthew Airy, who this time is going to talk about uh, Chinese-led judicial and um, arbitrary networks that facilitates economic integration across the, the region. So Matthew, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Julian. It's really a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank all the organizers for having me. And also it's great to go after Susan. Susan is really the expert on the Supreme People's Court. Everybody should read her uh, blog, Supreme People's Court Monitor. It's an outstanding source of information and analysis. I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me for one moment. One moment, this is not picking up my PowerPoint again, just bear with me here.
All right, hopefully people can see that. Yes, it's good, Matthew. Excellent. All right, at last. Um, so in the research project that I'm a part of, which I'll describe in a moment, we view the, the BRI as part of a broader historical trend uh, of Chinese cross-border uh, business, including investment and trade throughout the world, but particularly in low-income and middle-income countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly uh, wrought negative externalities on uh, these cross-border transactions. Uh, as it has done for other export, um, uh, sorry, capital exporting countries throughout the world. Yet most likely post pandemic, uh, China will continue to engage in international trade and investment. Uh, it should be remembered that with the concept of dual circulation, one prong of that concept is in fact international um, um, cross-border work. So this will most likely continue in some kind of uh, recalibrated form. So in terms of the research project that I'm fortunate to be the, the head of the China Law and Development Project hosted at the University of Oxford, funded by uh, a grant from the European Research Council in Brussels, uh, we are looking at the role of law in China's global development. So that includes both that kind of the international or transnational level, and also in terms of China's bilateral relationships with host states that receive Chinese capital through investment, trade, aid, and other sources. Uh, conceptually, we examine networks, institutions, and practices that constitute the connective fiber uh, of these emerging and evolving relationships between China and its partners. So again, multilateral, uh, bilateral, international, transnational, and then the national level, and then all the way down to, to the local level. Um, epistemologically, we're interested in sort of decentering the Western gaze, if you will. So a lot of what we know about Chinese law comes from the Anglo-American or Western European perspective. These are some of the classic books that, that illustrate this point. Um, what we're trying to do is shake this up a little bit, diversify the perspective, be more inclusive. And so we work with uh, researchers, particularly young researchers, all, young researchers all over the world from Kenya, Nigeria to Mongolia, Cambodia, uh, China, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. And, the, and again, the goal is to try to understand uh, law from uh, Chinese law in particular, from new perspectives, from new um, perches, if you will. And we use uh, interdisciplinary methodologies, uh, law and sociology, law and anthropology, uh, uh, generally kind of law and social sciences, uh, with a particular emphasis on qualitative methods, uh, interviewing, participation, observation, ethnography, and others. So judicial cooperation is one prong of a multifaceted trend uh, that points to the growing relevance of Chinese law and legal institutions in these uh, global transactions. Uh, the Supreme People's Court's initiatives are at the heart of this in particular, uh, with the judicial assistance treaties and MOUs that Professor Finder has, has pointed to. So I see my goal as sort of broadening the scope of the discussion uh, to examine some of the other uh, intersecting and complementary networks that are also part of this process and to try to understand what is, what is happening here. Um, so in addition to the uh, Supreme People's Court, uh, Judicial Assistance Treaties and MOUs with uh, BRI partners, we see networks that are forming across the legal, judicial, and arbitration domain. So up top here, we have, the, um, we have various uh, uh, party state organs, whether it's the Ministry of Justice, uh, China Law Society, the All of China Lawyers Association, uh, which is obviously uh, the, the lawyer uh, membership group. We have a number of educational institutions, including the National Judicials College and uh, the law schools that play a very important role. We have multilateral organizations and institutions, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, FOCOC, the Forum for Collaboration with China and Africa. And then of course, the arbitration institutions, CTAC, BIAC, SHIAC, and SKIA. So at, in Beijing respectively, SHIAC in Shanghai and SKIA in, in Shenzhen. So all of these are, um, creating, forming uh, their own networks. They're very much overlapping and, and, and intersecting. So I think the, the kind of first question for us is what are these networks? Well, uh, first and foremost, pre-pandemic at least, there were face-to-face -face meetings. They were opportunities for Chinese lawyers, arbitrators, judges, officials, business people to interact with counterparts uh, in these various countries through conferences, seminars, symposia, and uh, trainings, trainings being a kind of elastic word. Um, 
Some of these have continued during the pandemic, they've gone online. So some of these fora have continued their efforts at promoting dialogue. Others have died out uh, actually through the course of the pandemic. Uh, and we'll see if they, uh, they pick up again um, in the post pandemic phase. They're very much initiated by China. Uh, they're pushed by China. But I, I would say that they wouldn't survive, or they wouldn't last if it was just a, a one-sided kind of operation. There is, um, there is an audience for these networks. Uh, there is demand. And I would say that they're sustained by their, their partners in these various countries who are very keen to engage with Chinese partners. I think it's also important to note that these are elite gatherings. So uh, when we think about the sort of comparative history, the global history of how uh, economic superpowers have engaged with legal systems outside of their own jurisdictions. When you think about, for example, the UK, the US, uh, France, Germany, and other states, um, uh, for the most part, uh, China is not engaging in, in, in such areas as, for example, uh, legal aid assistance or, or developing, revising, reforming uh, legal institutions to increase access to justice in these various jurisdictions in the so-called global south. Rather, these are institutions that are very much elite corporate uh, entities, uh, uh, oftentimes focused on dispute resolution to assist with these cross-border deals. And, and as Professor Finder said, oftentimes these are memorialized through various types of soft law agreements, uh, MOUs, and other, other types of, of, um, of documents. So these are just, uh, just to give you kind of a visual, uh, this is one data point uh, in terms of the work of the, the China Law Society, uh, which has uh, run a series of annual conferences on international trade and investment. Uh, we've been looking at this since 2014. Hundreds of lawyers, again, judge, judges, arbitrators, business people, officials from countries throughout the world, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Pacific and elsewhere have attended these meetings uh, to engage with Chinese partners uh, in, in, in a number of these fora. Um, I think a really important question is, what do these networks do? And broadly speaking, there are kind of two extreme views, I think, on, on these networks. The first is that, well, they're basically an all expenses paid trip to Beijing. So you can have Beijing Kalya and you can, you can look at the Great Wall. Um, uh, another view sort of at the other end of the spectrum are that these are formative of what uh, Professor Tsai and his co-author have called transnational judicial dialogues using the language of uh, Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter, who kind of uh, championed this, this concept during the height of the so-called liberal internationalist era. Uh, so those, those are two, again, very sort of different views. I, I, I would posit that the reality is probably somewhere in between. Uh, these two different perspectives, and we see the networks uh, fulfilling a multiplicity of roles. So first, I would say there's a technical or, or practical or pragmatic dimension, oftentimes logistical, procedural, um, in that the networks, uh, these meetings, conferences, and so on, sustained dialogues are really addressed at specific issues that are of interest to international audiences. So for example, political risk insurance, investor state dispute resolution, uh, and so on, right? So very thematically organized and, and targeted. Uh, secondly, they're designed to broaden knowledge of Chinese law and its institutions. And I think that could be unpacked further. I'll, I'll, I'll do that in a moment. Um, thirdly, they facilitate mutual recognition enforcement of, of foreign judgments. This is certainly a concern on, on, the, on the China side. It's a concern on uh, the, the side of many host states as well. And, and related to that, the uh, recognition enforcement of, of foreign orbital awards. Um, uh, related, they are, they're uh, formative of judicial assistance measures, services, mm -hmm. service of process, et cetera. Uh, I think more fundamentally, they, they are opportunities to facilitate familiarity between uh, Chinese legal experts and their partners outside of China so that they can address problems that may arise uh, in the course of business down the line. And, and really very uh, practical issues, for example, referrals uh, for helping colleagues identify um, uh, a firms, uh, law firms in various uh, countries that can assist either Chinese clients or non-Chinese clients 
in dealing with various compliance issues uh, that are uh, jurisdiction specific. Um, and also, as Professor Finder said, they, they help disseminate information about legal developments in China and the, the so-called IT courts and the smart courts are, are re a recurring theme in these discussions. I would say beyond the technical and the practical, uh, what I find very interesting is the kind of communicative or symbolic dimensions of these meetings. And, and one of the phrases that one sees again and again in a lot of these documents is telling the story of China's rule of law, which I think is, is really fascinating. Um, and, and this is a, an opportunity for Chinese to explain to audiences, mostly in developing countries, how China has built out its legal system, particularly in the area of private international law, dealing with uh, cross-border commercial uh, transactions and the disputes that arise in the course thereof. And, and then similar uh, to, to, to the foregoing, uh, you have the inclusion of Xi Jinping thought and rule of law, uh, again, sort of disseminating uh, uh, sort of um, the intersection of, of, of uh, law and politics as understood in China uh, for broader audiences in developing countries with the idea that this will foster uh, mutual understanding and, and also help um, uh, the, the goal of creating opportunities for common development, particularly as China is increasingly engaged in the, in the realm of international development assistance. Um, okay, so that's all kind of uh, theoretical uh, potentially for the most part, but the question then is, what, what effects do they have? So what do these networks actually do? And one of the things we've been doing is talking with people who have attended these meetings and, and, and there the, the results are a bit mixed. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, foreign judges and lawyers say, well, it's very helpful to understand Chinese law. You know, I'm very curious. I wanna, I wanna know how this works. Um, I may potentially have a matter that touches on Chinese law. I may have a case or receive a case that involves a, an issue of Chinese law. Uh, but oftentimes the complaint is that the instruction is very vague. It's 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 um, it's introductory. It's very basic, and uh, people would would ask for more detail and more uh, practical detail in terms of how things work, not just the theory but the practice. Uh, uh, other people would say that well, there are important lessons that are learned, uh, and one of these I think is is a consistent mes message on the push side on the, on the China side of things which is that the, the, the legal system has its own efficiencies. Um, and this is something that comes up again in a number of these fora in that the uh, Chinese system um, arbitration in particular is one that is, is especially uh, efficient and that therefore it, it, has, um, it has potential lessons for audiences outside of China. Um, beyond this, beyond the kind of subjective understanding of, of what's happening and, and the thoughts uh, and the responses, I think it's fair to say that some of these networks lay the foundations for collaborative institutions. And what I'd like to do now is just focus on one of these in particular. Um, so this is uh, an image of the launching of the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center, which, as I understand it, is the first legal institution China has co-created outside of China. In particular, it's the first dispute resolution mechanism China has created outside of China. This was established in 2015 uh, through the work of uh, uh, the networking work, I should say in particular of the China Law Society uh, that was very involved in laying the groundwork for this uh, through FOCOC, the Forum of Collaboration with China and Africa through their, their legal forum. Um, and uh, as of 2015, an agreement was made between um, uh, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa, uh, which is a leading arbitration um, uh, organization in, in the African continent, one of the most sophisticated, um, technically proficient. Uh, an agreement was made between uh, the ABSA uh, and SHIAC in Shanghai. And this was formative of, the, of this initial kind of understanding to create this very interesting, very, I would say, bespoke uh, institution, which I'll uh, uh, expound upon in a moment. So part of this is, is looking at Chinese uh, approaches to international commercial arbitration and whether or not they are helpful uh, for jurisdictions outside of China. That is, are there lessons that can be transplanted from China's experience in international commercial arbitration uh, for other jurisdictions that are trying to develop this industry. And there are a number of arguments for uh, Chinese approaches to ICA, international commercial arbitration. Uh, speed, v generally speaking, uh, Chinese arbitration is much quicker than uh, arbitration at the London Court of International Arbitration or ICC arbitration 
in Paris or elsewhere. Uh, because of the speed, uh, the costs are lower. And of course, that's terrifically uh, attractive to the parties. And then, and then again, this theme of efficiency, that there's great procedural efficiency in, in these approaches to, um, to, uh, to arbitrating disputes. Um, however, having said that, um, one would also have to look for the, the arguments against. And uh, there is a kind of foundational structural iniquity, if you, if you will, in terms of how arbitration, uh, uh, how the, the landscape is formed in China in that the arbitration commissions, the Zhongzai Wei and Hui have uh, quite a bit of power vis-a-vis um, -vis the arbitration tribunal, tribunal in a way that is quite aberrational uh, across the sort of global landscape of arbitration. Uh, that is not just the arbitration commissions, but the, the PRC courts can um, intervene in, in the arbitration process in ways that um, uh, most jurisdictions would, would find aberrational. Um, uh, related, there is the 1994 arbitration law, which Professor Finder mentioned, uh, which is unfortunately outdated on a number of points. Um, first and foremost, it does not comply with the Institutional Model Law on, on International Arbitration, uh, and that itself is an outlier in East Asia. If you look at mm, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, if you look at uh, 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 South Korea, uh, Singapore, um, uh, jurisdictions in the region, you're going to see much more uh, sort of conformity and convergence with UNCITRAL standards, but, but not China. China is very unusual in that regard. And that impacts, for example, competence, competence, uh, the idea of the seat, uh, which are absent in the 1994 arbitration law. And certainly SPC and the arbitration commissions have tried to fill in gaps, but nonetheless, the, fun, the, the legislation itself is, is out of date. Um, as I'm sure people are aware, as of July last year, a number of proposals were were, uh, were suggested, um, these are under consideration. Many of these are, are very far reaching and address some of these issues, but they don't address the foundational structural issue, which is the power of the, of the arbitration commission. So all this would suggest that our Chinese arbitration may not be the best model for developing countries, right? Um, that there are serious, serious issues here. So let's go back to KJAC. So KJAC, as I mentioned, was initially formed between AFSA Southern Africa and Chiac in Shanghai. It since um, 2015 has expanded to include the Nairobi Court of International Arbitration in Kenya uh, and the OHADA uh, network, that is the Francophone uh, African states. And then on the Chinese side, also the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration and the Beijing International Arbitration uh, Center. So it's a really interesting sort of network itself, the, uh, a kind of network of arbitration hubs that exist between uh, African states and, and China that cooperate to deal with issues of cross-border uh, dispute resolution through arbitration. Um, but, but I do think it is important to mention sort of the political context and some of uh, the intersection of these overlapping networks that I mentioned at the outset. So here, for example, is an image from the um, uh, marketing material of KJAC. And you can see that the, the first message here, the kind of preface introduction is written by uh, Wang Li Chun. Uh, Wang Li Chun, uh, it bears mentioning, was the former party secretary of Xinjiang from 1994 to 2010, who was responsible for the treatment of over uh, well, 10 million in total population Uyghurs, uh, whose currently their, their culture, society, communities are, are being uh, violently transformed through so-called re-education centers. Uh, his next job, uh, as you can see here, was to head up the, the China Law Society. Now, this information is oftentimes excluded in these network formations, but, but I do think it's relevant to point out that there is this tight intersection uh, between these various types of, of entities in, in the Chinese ecosystem. Um, it, it, one of the things that we're very interested in the, in, in the project, uh, one of the things that we want to do is really focus on the perspective and the experience of those individuals and in host states. So, so how do they perceive Chinese law and legal institutions? What are some of their preconceptions? What is the basis of their knowledge and, and how is that knowledge enhanced informed and, and modified through the course of their interactions with Chinese partners. And this is just a quote from a Kenyan lawyer um, who was uh, in attendance on one of the road shows that was uh, led by Xiac and a number of officials from Shanghai. And she said the takeaway was that it was uh, complimentary for Chinese companies to access dispute resolution mechanisms that they have faith in and are not domestic in origin. So that are not Kenyan in this case. 
So it was driven by the Chinese government and large Chinese companies. So there you have a very kind of um, explicit statement that this is an initiative that really was, was China driven. And then you have the, the Kenyan audience kind of responding to, to what is uh, presented to them. Um, and what we can see here, what I think KJAC really shows is that the network that the China Law Society established was formative of this institution. Um, and, and the problem here, and this dovetails again very nicely with what, what Professor Finder was saying, this question of harmonization. How do you harmonize the PRC arbitration regime with the South African one, which is uh, based upon the UNCTRAL model law, right? Their 2017 um, Act on International Arbitration is, is uh, written in reference to UNCTRAL. Um, and, and initially, so this is a really fascinating process, right? They're trying to figure this out. How do you, how do you reconcile these two very different regimes? And they issued actually a series of rules, the first in 2015, uh, and then they ex extended their network and included these other arbitration hubs. And then they uh, came out with uh, a, another uh, 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 uniform rules in 2020, because the first one was found to be unsatisfactory for reasons that I can explain uh, later. Um, uh, but I think what's important here is, is, again, that the Chinese were mainly driving the bus on this one. So one of the drafters of the KJAC administrative rules uh, wrote, we in Africa are happy to learn from the Chinese experience and to apply it where it is in our mutual interest to do so. So there's a real interest in learning from the Chinese. The Chinese are suppliers now, if you will, of, of global legal norms. And I think this is a really fascinating, uh, really interesting development that, that um, we should all be uh, following and, and learning from. Um, the ultimate resolution or the solution to this problem was to create a kind of two-tier structure, if you will, of rules. So there's uniform rules that apply to all these arbitration hubs, but then uh, parties can opt out of those uh, uniform rules and use the local rules of the specific arbitration center. So for example, BIAC or SHIAC or what have you, um, because of these differences that I mentioned between the, the two different regimes. So that was kind of the the solution to this problem, um, which is an interesting one in terms of drafting rules. Um, but it does mean that, for example, um, it allows Chinese parties who have disputes with African counterparties uh, to, to continue to arbitrate those disputes in accordance with uh, Chinese law, um, uh, according to Chinese arbitration rules in Chinese courts, uh, in Chinese language, as, as the case may be, uh, on Chinese soil. So it's an interesting sort of extension in some ways of the, the jurisdiction, if you will, of, of the Chinese arbitration centers. So I wanna end on a couple of sort of provocations, if I will. Uh, so the first is, uh, can we ask uh, whether or not China has something like law power? So moving beyond soft power to law power. And so law power would be uh, the notion uh, that I'd like to uh, put forward that uh, countries can safeguard their commercial and geostrategic interests through law. And it's not just law fair, which is weaponizing law, uh, although China may be doing that with anti-suit injunctions, uh, but it's also through uh, persuasion in terms of persuading legal elites in other countries, right? That Chinese law can be a model for uh, legal development. Um, and, and so the important thing here is to note that it's not just an instrumentalized notion of law, sort of a Weberian notion of law, if you will, but it, it may also create a system of signs or symbols or discourses about law that can be constitutive of, of reality. And here I'm thinking of the work of, of, of semiotic uh, theoreticians like Baudrillard. And this dovetails with uh, one of my early observations about how Chinese law operates domestically in China in terms of uh, this massive discourse about rule of law. And yet the reality of people in China in terms of their interaction with law may be very different from that discursive production, which creates this, this idea of sort of legal surrealism, that law can be surreal in China. Um, and, and China's doing this not just through legal transplants or building extraterritorial courts, which is what the Western superpowers did, the US, uh, the, Britain, uh, the Brits and others, uh, which is based upon hard power and coercion, but rather through the technocratic rules of international commercial arbitration and other uh, forms of private international law. So it's really early days, uh, but for now we can see that the networks are forming, they are uh, constitutive of collaboration, and, and that these collaborations may continue to sustain various economic dependencies into the future. And the very last image here, just wanted to 
uh, provide a list of, of readings uh, based upon our recent publications. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to the questions. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. I think that both your presentation uh, and the whole project you, you are carrying are incredibly interesting. Um, but for now, as promised earlier, I suggest that we have a short Q&A. Um, I, see, I see that here in Hong Kong, it's 4.55 p.m. Um, must be around 9, 9 a.m. In, in London or the rest of Europe. So I think we can have a 10 minutes uh, Q&A. And, and that's going to be very easy because the, uh, the audience is, is very good. And if I may say very fair, we have two questions for Suzanne and two questions for Matthew. So let me perhaps simply um, read them out, starting with Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, the first question is the following. There is only a very small number of cases registered by the CICC. What do you think about this law record? Uh, is it a full-time court or just a part-time uh, as Supreme court, okay? And, and there is a follow-up question, which is, uh, what, does that, what does it say about the future? So that's the, the first group of questions for Suzanne. Suzanne, you're very popular. You get a second group of questions, uh, <laughs> which is the following. Um, someone is asking, someone is saying, I'd like to know whether the different mindsets regarding the law in a vast project such as the BRI may ultimately be detrimental to protect China's Mianzi with investors. And what do you see as main risks to Chinese companies when contracting BRI projects overseas? I'll let you think a bit and see how you want to answer these questions. Let me just um, read out the questions, the other questions to um, Matthew. The first one, um, It's for both, in fact, Matthew and, and Suzanne, but perhaps Matthew will want to take the lead on this one. Uh, how will China respond to increasing transparency requirements and the UN cycle and XT? How will it affect future negotiations and arbitrations between China and foreign investors? So that's all about transparency, interesting. And another one, the last one for Matthew, um, how has the BRI changed the way disputes are conducted in BRI recipient countries. Can you identify changes in the jurisdictions covered by your projects, uh, whether in Southeast Asia or Africa? And there is this very last question is mine, actually, I forgot to, to mention that. All right, can I, can I invite Susan to, to answer her questions? Um, uh, yeah, oh, so the CACC one, oh, that one's easy. Uh, so is, is the CIC a full-time or part-time court? Part-time court. So the, the judges are doing the CIC cases on top of their normal work. And some people have uh, two or three different roles in addition to being a CICC judge. So yeah, I checked yesterday, I think only eight judgments or rulings had been issued of the, in, they've accepted, it was 18 last summer. I'm not sure whether they're up to 20 yet. Um, yes, yeah, so, and then they need to be different, you know, important in difficult cases. Um, yeah, the idea is to, that they should make law in the in the Chinese sense. So fill in some gap in either in in Chinese law in some way. Uh, what does it say? I think that, um, as I said earlier, I think the SPC is trying to figure out the proper role for the CACC and also trying to figure out uh, what, what the expert committee, especially on the perhaps especially on the foreign side should do. Because when I checked with a number of foreign experts last summer, they hadn't been approached. 
and um, yeah. So that's on the CICC side. Uh, different mindset, I think. It, legal mindset, uh, definitely, but I think that's that's actually something Matthew, you know, Matthew has talked about really. Um, Mien's, uh, you know, it's face involved. I mean, I, it, I suppose it depends on the project, whether there's, it's a, a, pro, a project, you know, a, a project uh, where the, the Chinese government is clearly, in, you know, is involved, like the, the Malaysian rail, rail project. So that's, <clears throat> very you know high stakes you know the government gets involved and the Chinese government gets involved in trying to resolve disputes many I think the majority are 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 business are commercial disputes you know you know building a power plant in Bangladesh or you know Albania or, or things like that and um yeah, so, so normal, you know, normal international commercial dispute resolution is involved. You know, sometimes it'll, it'll, these agreements have ICC contracts, sometimes Singapore, sometimes HKIC, you know, it, it all depends. Main risks to Chinese companies, the book I mentioned mentions a lot of them. There are political risks on the foreign side. You know, if the, if the you know, if there are changes on, you know, the, uh, actually, from my point of view, having been a commercial lawyer doing China work in the nineties, uh, oh, so Billy say the CIC is a permanent. Yeah, you know, it's part. I, so being that you're saying the CIC is a permanent adjudication, the body of the um, so he said it's a yeah obviously it's an international commercial case. Um, so most of the collegial panels of the CICC are have been uh, five judges and it's one instant so they tend to be complex cases and it's a uh, uh, first instance is, is final. Um, main risk there, so a lot of political, so political risks uh, for Chinese, there are political risks, supplier risks, legal risks, um, the, the whole panoply of risks of an international business to you know, working in the global south. And, and if you read that, Book that's that I recommended. You'll see that you know. Plus, the, the, there are also issues involved with uh, Chinese suppliers, you know, um, services suppliers and and equipment suppliers. You know, so there there are, there are a lot of risks involved. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Matthew, I'd like you to answer the, the two questions perhaps as briefly as you can. I see that sure. many more questions are coming for you. I'll keep the new questions for the final Q&A, all right? Okay, so I just wanted to thank you very much, Julian, just to touch upon a couple of these points. So the first, I, I thought it was interesting the question about Mianzi, about Chinese face. And I, I think, you know, first of all, it's, it's very hard to generalize about, you know, Chinese investors. Chinese investors are fantastically uh, diverse. Uh, some are incredibly sophisticated. They're, you know, world-class operators. Others maybe are just going out for the first time and they don't have too much experience doing cross-border work, right? Um, but I'd say generally, if I could make a very general sort of statement um, that uh, coming from the Chinese context, there's a certain plastic or pliable or malleable view of law uh, that may not always work in that same way outside of China. Um, and so there is a different sort of culture of law that, that operates, I think, sometimes in these interactions between Chinese and, and their partners, um, where they maybe, for example, won't totally uh, respect the local legal system. And, and we've documented cases of this where um, 
Chinese business parties are very much, uh, you know, looking to find workarounds uh, to not deal with the formal legal system, in particular, the court system in, in countries like Ethiopia or Pakistan or elsewhere. Um, and so that creates tension uh, and potentially a, a loss of a loss of face in, in, in that sense. So I just wanted to to make that that note in terms of the transparency question. That's interesting. I guess the, the, the question is, where is the transparency requirement coming from? So as I said, the, the Chinese arbitration system is not UNCTRAL compliant. Um, the, the new proposals for the reform of the 1994 arbitration law increasingly look towards the UNCTRAL model law, uh, but they're not really, I, I would say, necessarily completely in conformity. Um, for reasons that I stated, and China historically has been very reluctant to use ICSID. So not now we're not we're not talking about international commercial arbitration, but we're talking about state investor dispute resolution, right? Which is a different sort of kettle of fish. Um, however, there are an increasing number of cases um, that are popping up where Chinese are the claimants in these uh, state investor disputes. And so I think the Chinese are diversifying in, in terms of how they're using various venues and fora for resolving their disputes. And I think they're going to be adapting to the transparency requirements in those different, um, in those different uh, venues. And there's no reason why they can't do that, right? So I think it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis and it'll be quite, kind of ad hoc what that looks like. In terms of how the BRI is changing the way disputes are conducted in recipient countries? This is a really interesting question. So I think generally what we found is that um, the local legal systems are much, much more complicated than I think the initial sort of um, optimism of the BRI would have suggested. And that uh, there's been a deluge of cases involving Chinese uh, parties in local courts, again, in, in South Asia and in and, and, and in Africa and elsewhere. Um, and so uh, that has created a massive uh, uh, learning curve for Chinese parties. They're working with local lawyers. They have to rely on local lawyers. That's sometimes a challenging relationship. Sometimes they hire other law firms to, to double check the work of the first law firms they hired, right? There's really interesting cultural questions that I think um, you know, again, stem from uh, the Chinese perspective on law and, and, and commercial law in particular as it operates in China. Again, it may not always operate in the same way outside of China. Um, but, but certainly there's a, there's a huge number of these local disputes, uh, you know, labor compliance issues, uh, uh, corruption, uh, you know, even some criminal matters. And, and the Chinese um, uh, companies are aware of this. And so one response is arbitration, right? Avoid local courts make sure that there's an arbitration uh, clause in your contract. And, uh, you know, LCIA is fine, ICC, um, uh, but let's try to promote Chinese arbitration. So I think that's part of the, 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 part of the, um, the push here for, for Chinese arbitration. Um, should I try to address this last question, Julian, on how Chinese law power relates to US and EU law power, or should I stop there? You can address it in, in one minute would be great. So, so in one minute, I think it's a really good question, this comparative. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by you know, questions of comparative law. And I think the Chinese uh, uh, sort of in their outbound push of the BRI, they've certainly learned from the Europeans and the Americans. There's a lot of, of, of adaptation uh, in terms of incorporation of, of uh, tested um, approaches to mitigating risks and to dispute resolution that the Americans and the Europeans have, have adopted and, and in some ways perfected. Um, but I also think the situation is fundamentally different in that uh, China is coming from a position in its own legal development that varies greatly to that of many European states or the US when it was going out so to speak. And so mm -hmm. the relative strength of the legal systems is quite different. I think generally China does uh, think about the EU as a potential model. It's much closer than the American approach. The American approach is, is predicated on military power and, and diplomacy, which uh, the Chinese, uh, that's not their, their strength so much. But I think the concepts of sort of, you know, the Brussels effect that Andrew, Andrew Branford has written about at Columbia uh, in terms of how multinational corporations sort of opt in to uh, the rules of the EU to, and apply those standards to their uh, global operations. I think that kind of approach is very, uh, very much of interest to the Chinese in terms of setting standards for future um, uh, approaches to international commerce. And I'll stop there, thanks. Wonderful, thank you both uh, Suzanne and, and Matthew for these very good questions, very good answers to questions which are also very good as by our uh, colleagues in attendance. Can I add one thing to what Matthew said? Yes, Real quick, so, um, because um, then we have to yeah, return yeah, to the, quick, the yeah. program. Just to say that with the Chinese companies, there's also 
the, you know, the varying levels of legal sophistication. Um, so in the book I mentioned, you can see that the, the Chinese writers are, get, can, are frustrated with the attitude, you know, of their companies, yeah, you know, company management towards law. All so right, thank the, you, Suzanne, yeah, for, yeah. for making this point. Um, it was a great Q&A. Now let's get back to the program and our next speaker with Yuan Li. Uh, Yuan will uh, discuss the new Chinese foreign investment law, which I don't know much about. I just know that it's in force since 2020, if I'm correct. But, but Yuan will tell us uh, more and everything about this new FIA. And over to you, Yuan. Uh, you went, yeah. Yes, I will share my PPT. Do you see it now? Ooh. I'm not sure. No, I don't see it. Uh, oh, yeah. Share screen at the yes. bottom. Good. Yes. We can see it almost. You can see it now, huh? Now we can see. Okay. Now, uh, good morning and good afternoon to uh, everybody. Uh, well, I will give a very brief introduction actually about the China's new foreign investment law uh, and then some implementation challenges. Uh, basically, I would like to first uh, inform you about four aspects that I think have reflect what is new in this foreign investment law. The number one is about the uh, pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list. Uh, well, what list does mean? Uh, it means it's a market entrance uh, place uh, uh, that uh, foreign investors will be accorded with the treat, uh, same treatment as domestic investors, except those investments that uh, provided uh, either prohibited or restricted in the negative list. Well, the system looks, uh, uh, why it looks so new in China is just because this Inter, uh, this uh, new system uh, stopped the case-by-case -case approval regime in China, which have uh, ha has operated for almost uh, 40 years since the opening up in the 1979 in China. Uh, so I think most of most of you now, what is the case-by-case -case approval uh, for ever foreign invested uh, project? But when you talk about the negative list, uh, I would like to draw your attention that it's not only the negative list for foreign investment access, which mentioned in the foreign investment law, but there are also two other uh, negative lists. One is the for foreign investment access in pilot free trade zones, like in Shanghai. And another bigger negative list is for market access which uh, per, uh, provide permitted and prohibited categories of uh, investment for both domestic and foreign uh, investors. And if investment sector or items are falling into these three negative list and the case by case approval, very often mutable approval remain. Uh, applicable today in, in China. Uh, another aspect I would like to emphasize that quite impressive in the foreign investment law is about uh, investment protection. And you see in this law, it provides that, that no expropriation of foreign investment if in, under uh, special circumstances, expropriation take place 
and it must be for the public interest in accordance with legal procedures and the compensation should be fair, reasonable and permanent. So this is a very similar as international uh, uh, commonly recognized standards. And moreover, in the implementation regulation, it's also a foreign investment law is also added that uh, uh, no discriminative, uh, discriminative uh, manner and that the compensation should be timely and using the market value for compensation. So this is the first time, you know, in Chinese law, it has provided very uh, specific uh, details about compensation for expropriation. And the second uh, improvement for protection of invest for investment is about the whether the profit made by a foreign investor uh, can be freely transferred uh, out of China. At least in the foreign investment law, it provides a soul. However, the law is said it's may, it, it's not a shell. Uh, so it's may, it's still the how to implement this uh, uh, principle uh, is still not yet uh, become an easy reality in China. And the third aspect of uh, protect of foreign investment is about not forced transfer technology. This is very often, I think, people refer to. Uh, and it's the first time in the foreign investment law, it clearly provides that uh, administrative agencies and their employees must not force transfer technology by administrative means. Uh, this is often, and also a similar provision with, uh, refer to the commercial secret of foreign invested uh, uh, enterprises. These two uh, provisions are very often referred to the uh, uh, pressure, actually, uh, a concern raised by the US China trade war that China often uh, imposed uh, um, the transfer technology and the disclosure of commercial secrets of, of foreign investor enterprise. So, this uh, can be considered as a reaction to the demand of the US in the bilateral uh, uh, trade ne negotiation. And another aspect I would like to emphasize is the foreign investment law also uh, specifically mentioned uh, that local uh, rule makers, uh, local government, that when they, they are also allowed, of course, uh, to make some uh, local uh, rules and regulations uh, relating to investment, but their uh, rule making cannot derogate of the legal rights or increase the obligation of foreign investors. This is also very interesting uh, uh, provision to limit the power of the local uh, rule maker. And finally, for the protection of foreign investor, there's a complaint system, which is really uh, before your foreign investment, you go to the mediation, arbitration, or litigation, you can use the government agencies uh, as the first result to make a complaint. So this system can also be quite uh, efficient and uh, low cost for the foreign investors. Now, uh, the third feature of the foreign investment law I would like to emphasize is the information importance system. Because the case-by-case -case approval uh, system uh, now has been abolished, so China has actually strengthened uh, information reporting system. This covers both the pre-establishment stage and the post-establishment stage. Uh, two main system reporting, one is the online enterprise registration system. Here, the foreign investors will use the same online system as domestic investors to register uh, their uh, investment project. 
and if they make any modification or to dissolve their uh, uh, project, they should they could always do uh, online. Another more complicated system is about the annual report. Uh, the after uh, in, I think it's in the in December 2019 and the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, several ministry, Ministry of Commerce and uh, minister, other ministries together have jointly issued several uh, uh, measures relating to the registration of the uh, annual report. And they follow a kind of system uh, we call the National Enterprise Credit Information Publicity System. And MOFCOM, Ministry of Commerce, and also the uh, other ministries, they share the information that the comp uh, company has provided in this uh, uh, annual report in order to supervise and control the foreign invested enterprises. This is a quite a complicated uh, system. And uh, last, I would like to mention is about the national security review system. I think for many uh, participants uh, from Europe, you are more familiar with the screening system uh, introduced by the EU in recent years. And China has followed the US model uh, since 2011, has introduced a kind of national security review of uh, foreign investment. Uh, in this uh, 2019 foreign investment law is for the first time that this system has been provided, of course, in the law. But it's very brief. It's only one article uh, saying that states shall establish a national security review of foreign investment that impact or may impact national security, very general. Then in December 20, uh, MOVCOM and the National uh, Development and Reform Commission jointly uh, issued the measures for the National Security Review of Foreign Investment. This measure uh, provides some details about the substantive and the procedure provisions, how the uh, review can be conducted. Uh, but however, you know, for such a complicated system, uh, the measure only have uh, 29 uh, articles. So many uh, uh, issues are still quite general and uh, vague. Uh, this system has caused uh, quite some concerns. Uh, uh, first, uh, especially about the, because there's no definition of uh, security, national security review and uh, Actually, it covers both market entry phase and the post establishment phase. So, and it's broadly it's applied. It can be applied to any foreign invested uh, project. So, the broad uh, scope of uh, national security review in this uh, measure uh, is quite a, a, a different. As for example, uh, in the earlier. Uh, a regulation on national security review. Uh, uh, the, I think the, the one in 2011 only limited to the merge and acquisition of domestic uh, enterprises by foreign uh, investor. So now, nowadays, the uh, scope has been um, really is open and available. So nowadays, uh, although the Chinese foreign investment law has abolished the case-by-case -case approval system, but the negative list, uh, pre-established uh, national treatment with the negative list, and the national security review system, and also the anti-monopoly law, uh, these three systems together actually have uh, not uh, have strengthened the government uh, supervision or control on, on foreign investment. Of course, the uh, pre-establishment uh, national treatment uh, make most of the uh, foreign investment project maybe easier. But for those uh, high-tech uh, investment in 
uh, some sensitive uh, sectors, the system actually is more uh, complicated. And challenges for implementation of this foreign investment law. I would like to address this issue first from domestic level. You know, the uh, foreign investment law and its implementation regulations uh, remain very general, and the further uh, enforcement measures are really necessary. In this aspect, I would like to refer to the 2015 draft of foreign investment law, which contains much more, uh, more uh, articles, uh, I think around 170 articles. And now the new foreign investment law only have 42 articles, you, so you can see. Uh, how much uh, in, uh, implementation work still necessary in the coming years. Another uh, challenge is the changing role of the government agencies. Uh, uh, I think the, the, because of the sheer size of China, you can see the local uh, enforcement uh, uh, level can be quite different. So this also, make the unified law, uh, how can be uh, equally applied in every place this in China is quite a problem. And MA remains a sensitive issue because uh, the old uh, MA provisions re remains uh, in force today. And it has some uh, conflicting uh, aspect with the foreign investment law. And another uh, challenge, I think uh, China really needed to show improved market access opportunities, not only in the law, but it's really as a reality. Uh, next, I would like to emphasize that's also referred to the first part of this webinar. It's about dispute settlement system uh, relating to foreign investment. Uh, of course, China provide litigation, arbitration, mediation. But uh, here I would also like to uh, draw your attention to see that uh, the, the uh, dispute settlement system, but relating to the foreign investment in China, uh, not only focus on the uh, domestic legal system, but also uh, look at a broader picture, like a bilateral investment treaties, even the free trade uh, agreement these investment chapters could all be used by foreign investors to uh, settle their dispute. And uh, I have looked at now, there are about uh, eight cases that foreign investors have brought China to the investor state arbitration. And there are about 15 known cases that Chinese investors have uh, used investor uh, state arbitration based on VIPs against other countries, also including African countries. Here I would like to mention, for example, recently uh, arbitral award just uh, uh, became public. It's a Chinese company, Zhongshan Fucheng uh, versus uh, Nigeria. And Chinese company won the case. Uh, so this is also, uh, could be a, uh, 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 example that will stimulate more Chinese companies to use the uh, BITs to settle the dispute. Uh, but of course, it's also another way around. Uh, foreign investors could use BITs uh, the same way as Chinese investors use them. And the last point I would like to emphasize that the implementation of this new com com uh, foreign investment law has become more complicated also because of the corona time. As you all, uh, uh, you may know, uh, in 2020 and 21, China have issued uh, like export control law, anti foreign sanction law, and unreliable entity list. Uh, these laws really have made the uh, foreign invest investor and the foreign investor enterprise uh, um, to operate more difficult uh, in China. Now, briefly mention another challenge from international uh, uh, context. I think that there is a general uh, lack of trust uh, uh, on the Chinese uh, system, uh, not only the dispute settlement system, but also the bear, uh, uh, built and road initiative. So the lack of trust is growing rather than shrinking. This, of course, will have some impact 
on the uh, uh, implementation of uh, Chinese law as well. And another one I would like to mention is uh, because at, at international level, there's an increasing demand and expectation on reciprocity, level playing field, and the fair competition. I think this also should be uh, more seriously uh, considered in China, whether they could, they could easily use the argument that China as a developing country and to uh, simple uh, deny the reciprocity. I think it's better to, to take the issue more seriously to see how the reciprocity could also benefit Chinese legal system uh, and economic uh, development in the long term. And another challenge uh, issue is the protection of uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, although the foreign investment, uh, investment law briefly touched upon this issue by providing the general principles, and I think for the uh, uh, improvement of the IPR uh, protection, especially uh, inside of China, it's not really on the foreign investment law, it's more on the domestic uh, IP law, patent law, and also the domestic court. Yeah? Uh, like China has already established a few specific uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, court. And another aspect I would see uh, from international perspective, a look at the Chinese investment law, uh, for investment law, one aspect is missing, it's about sustainable development. If you see China actually has put the sustainable development and green economy in their development goal, uh, and why not have uh, also uh, uh, at least provide a principle in the foreign investment law, at least maybe in the future uh, implementation uh, uh, regulations, this could be addressed. Thank you, I will stop here. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Ewan. I was just typing uh, some questions for all of you that we can look at um, a little later in the Q&A. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, our friend and colleague, uh, Li Bin, who is going to talk about the, the RCEP and its um, ramification for the BRI, or vice versa, perhaps the BRI effects on the RCEP. Li Bin, I hand over to you. Thank you. I have your first uh... Uh, share the uh, my slides. Could you see the, fly, the slide? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Professor Shek, for uh, organizing this event. Also, my thanks go to colleagues from uh, KU Leuven for uh, hard working in, uh, for this for this event. Uh, I will firstly uh, explain why I chose this topic to observe BRI from the perspective of. Uh, RCEP. Uh, in fact, I was the first given the topic to uh, uh, make a presentation on the legal dimension of BRI from the perspective of international law. I think this is a very uh, wide and a general topic. I can hardly master this topic, especially uh, there is much difference behind how people perceive or understand international law. So I choose to probably uh, change uh, the topic uh, uh, from a regional agreement. One of the major reason is that most scholars observe BRI is not rule-based. True, there are many uh, bilateral documents, MOU, but they are not considered as a formal treaty or agreement. But at the same time, uh, I uh, perceived another trend that China is also into more and more regional uh, free trade agreement. So I want to compare the two trends of Chinese uh, reform and opening policy to see the, the potential interplay or mutual influence between BRI and the regional trade agreement. So this is why I choose this topic. I think um, one people reflect over the interplay or the potential relationship between the two set of uh, 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 regional cooperation. Uh, the conceptual framework is relevant to understand or to perceive BI against the larger background of general international law. I think people could use the roughly the same conceptual framework or 
uh, conceptual tools. So that's why I choose this topic to compare BRI, but not in a wider perspective, perspective but only with the, uh, the, the most recent regional agreement, RCEP. So I start with uh, what I know uh, about uh, uh, BRI. Firstly, uh, according to the latest declarations, should I say declaration, but it's kind of a, a, a official document to show the Chinese uh, leading uh, policy behind the BRI. BRI aims to uh, constructively contribute to the reform of the current global governance system and to economic globalization. It is written in the, the Belt and Road Initiative Progress Contributions Prospects published in 2019. So there is a strong ambition uh, to, to the current uh, uh, reform of the global governance. And what we know about the RCEP, now, it is widely recognized as the world's largest free trade area. It is rule-based cooperation. As the preamble of the agreement states that the agreement seeks to establish clear and mutually advantageous rules to facilitate trade and investment, including participation in regional and the global supply chains. And also, RCEP is an Asian-led agreement. Negotiations for the RCEP will recognize Asian centrality in the emerging regional economic architecture. But when people know something about Asian, it is a community, the community vision of 2025 20, uh, stipulates the community is composed of a political security, economic community, social culture community. So I think behind the ASEAN, there is also a strong ambition to achieve regional integration from a different aspect, political, economic, and cultural aspect. And also we know that the RCEP agreement is an open nature. It has an open accession clause uh, which means any other external economic partners, once they after uh, made the completion of the negotiation, they could become uh, one of the partners. So this is what's written in the guiding principles and objectives of negotiating and regional uh, of the uh, negotiating the regional comprehensive economic partnership. Uh, particularly in 2020 in the joint media statement of the 10th regional intersessional ministerial meeting, it is declared that RCEP remains open for India. So this is another uh, example to show the ambition of uh, uh, RCEP. Then next issue also very uh, important to uh, understand RCEP, it, it is one of the leading objective is to establish a modern, comprehensive, high quality, mutually beneficial economic partnership framework. At the same time, the agreement will take into account the different stage of development, especially for the least developed country parties. Finally, uh, I think RCEP is, uh, is ongoing uh, process means that uh, some aspect of the free trade agreement, especially for the dispute settlement, on which most uh, legal scholars uh, pay much attention, uh, there is no investor state dispute settlement provisions. And uh, for the future, there will be a built-in work program to, uh, to continue to construct this regional framework with the investor state dispute settlement. And now, uh, let me move to the China's future reform opening policy. Uh, there is a latest announcement made by President Xi uh, during his speech at the 2022 20, uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, he said that China will continue to promote high quality 
Belt and Road Corporation, how to understand high quality. And after the mentioning the, uh, the promotion of the high quality Belt and Road Corporation, he said that the RCEP has entered into force and the China will faithfully implement its obligations and its agreements. And at the same time, he mentioned also China will participate the negotiation process about the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTTP, and also the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, the DEPA. So this is a very significant uh, expression after mentioning, after having mentioned the BRI, China clearly indicated the intention to participate the regional, uh, 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 or should I say the regionalization of uh, economic uh, and for trade and uh, investment uh, cooperation. Especially very recently, the Ministry of Commerce, together with other ministerial organs, published the announcement of the guiding opinions on the implementation asset. This is a long document, I have no time to go into detail, but I'd like to uh, uh, draw your attention on the following keywords. These guiding opinions express RCEP as a chance for uh, China's reform and future opening. And also, the, this guiding opinions perceive RCEP uh, as a channel to, to even uh, enhance the high level opening of China. And also this guiding opinions mentioned China will build a network of free trade zones on high standards. And to take the opportunity of implementing RCEP to increase China's global competitiveness. So it follows that what I guess on the relationship between BRI and RCEP Roughly, there are, could, there are two kinds of rhetoric or two kinds of observation. One is more positive for aesthetic reasons. So they think uh, BRI and RCEP could mutually supportive. They can uh, cooperate one with the other, enhance one with the, one with the other. One of the example is there is the agreement concluded in 2018 uh, between China and the Eurasian Economic Union. In the preamble, it is stipulates that the importance of the conjunction of the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and the Road Initiative as a means of establishing strong and stable trade relations. So this is one of the example to show a, a positive attitude to, toward BRI and the uh, regional free trade agreement. But is there any possibility for kind of competition concurrence or even sometimes some kind of tension or conflict between the two form of regional cooperation on one side, the BRI, which is very flexible and the other side, rule-based system of RCEP, which, uh, uh, with uh, very detailed legal rules, sorry, with legal rules on uh, uh, trade and investment, could the financial flow, trade in goods and service, be attracted more by RCEP than by BRI? So I think there are potentially some competition between the two form of. Uh, uh, regional cooperation, but I'm not sure. So I, I say at the very beginning, I guess, besides the cooperation, the mutually supportive relationship, that could be some competition or, or tension between the two sides. And also probably, are some maybe in the future seen as a model for BI, that means to enhance BI in, throughout the whole quality, whole quality that means to, uh, in, to introduce a, a kind of regional free trade agreement 
very similar to RCEP or not among the BI countries. I'm not sure this is for future. So uh, I have questions rather than answers. So I invite the participants of attendees of this conf conference to give your opinion. Uh, I hope finally my observation between the relations between BRI and uh, RCEP is not a much ado about nothing. <laughs> I hope that can, can be useful for uh, observing BRI and uh, against the wider pers perspective of, of general international law. So that presentation, thank you. Thank you very much, Libin. So we have reached uh, the last uh, 15 minutes for this event. I'd like to congratulate the, the speakers for perfect time management. We have uh, 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Uh, so um, my role is going to be very simple because we have received uh, a number of questions that you may have seen already in the chat box. Uh, we have questions for Professor, Professor Yuen Li and for, for you, Li Bin. Um, I might be able to, to ask uh, also a few more questions. Um, but let me simply start with the, the first question for uh, Yuen. So someone Yuen is asking if an investment is made in an industry not found in the list of these uh, regulated industries, does this mean that prior governmental approval is required? And how this work in practice? Which level of governments, I guess, the, the, the colleague means which level of governments will be involved and, and so on. Um, for Libin, uh, what BRI countries, what, sorry, what BRI countries could join RCEP? Meaning, I just read out, right? meaning how BRI can boost RCEP membership. Uh, and also as far as Chinese investments in BRI jurisdictions are concerned, isn't it a mistake to only think in terms of alternative between all Sino foreign BATs, or I guess RCEP, and potential role of CICC? Isn't the solution in MFN? Well, it's a pretty broad question, so you, you might want to address only some of the points and, and other colleagues might want to also uh, chip in. Let me just add the third question to Matthew. That's a question we received a little earlier. Um, and so for Matthew, the question is, would you say that this system could be considered a version of early Chinese legal transplantation in these countries like Kenya? All right, that's the first round of questions. Let me ask um, uh, Yuan to answer first, then Libin and then Matthew, and then we'll see whether we have more time for more questions. Thank you. Uh, Julia, if I understand your question clearly, because we are really listen, long distance. Uh, the question, uh, the question is, is also in the, in the chat box, OK, if you haven't understood. Yeah, the problem is I cannot read it. Uh, <laughs> if it's a foreign investment project, it's not provided in the negative list. What kind of the procedure that the, for the registration? Is that the question? That's the way I understand this question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if it's uh, not uh, uh, provided in the negative list, the foreign investors could just go through the registration system, which is uh, managed by the state administration for market regulation. So it is an online registration system. But of course, like I have mentioned, uh, now the national security review of our investment is very broad. So it, uh, even you are in one investment project is not uh, belong to the, uh, the, the lowest regulated uh, uh, items in the negative list, there is a potential uh, uh, also a risk that you have to go through the national security review, but the chance may be not apply to all, uh, many projects, but the risk is there. Thank you. Yeah. Next, uh, Li Bin. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, it's a hard one, but I, I should say that uh, 
there is no clear frontier for BRI. Uh, in fact, ISEAN is also considered one of the uh, area covered by the BRI. And China is also uh, uh, revising uh, free trade agreement New Zealand. And also there is ongoing project the, uh, revising the uh, free trade agreements between China and Cambodia and then as other countries. So I think Myanmar could also, uh, is also one of the important partners for BRI countries, but he's, he's also a member of the ISIN community. Uh, what I mean is that uh, for in the future, whether if China continue to promote or enhance cooperation uh, within the uh, within the BI area, would it be possible to uh, follow the mode of uh, uh, RCEP? That means to uh, introduce a kind of a regional free trade agreement or comprehensive agreement on the trade and the investment to um, uh, to change the current very flexible, uh, not based on the very strict, stringent legal framework cooperation of BRI. So this is one of the guests for the future, but it can be vice versa. That means uh, whether the RCEP will uh, finally in several years turn into another kind of uh, uh, regional cooperation, even though there is a, an agreement uh, rule-based cooperation, but uh, with the participation of many uh, members beyond ISIN, because it's open nature, would it turn into another fell on the road? <laughs> I'm not sure. So this is uh, uh, another guess. So what I mean that there are more, more and more regional trade agreements. Some people describe it as kind of a bowl of a spaghetti, but I like to observe this phenomenon uh, by image of a billiard. There are so many small balls in the table. There is a regional trade agreement. There is a, a BI, the kind of a, a economic a financial diplomacy, which is not uh, based on a very stringent legal framework. But even though they exist, they coexist, there may be some interesting interplay, interaction, and mutual influence. So what is the future of uh, 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 the global multilateral trading system or, or what is the global uh, trade and investment framework is quite complicated to see. So this is my perception. Thank you. you just before you hand over to, to Matthew, um, my quick you know, reaction to, to your very good answer, uh, Bean, is basically, uh, what, what you cover is the trade dimension. But as far as investment is concerned, how do you see the role of MFN? Because it is true that China has really signed, uh, I don't have the, I think more than 140 something BITs, right? They virtually all provide for MFN. And so they already constitute a kind of multilateral treaty for investment and for investment arbitration. Um, so, so how do you, do you see this? Or you know, to connect the question to, to what you discussed today, the ASEP, do you see the ASEP replacing, having the vocation to fully replace existing Chinese investment treaties? Or on the contrary, you would say that these all BATs still displays a great potential um, that could uh, cast some doubt as for the implementation of ASEP. That's a big question again. Uh, perhaps take, take some time to, to reflect Let's have uh, Matthew's answer and we can come back to you. Thank you, uh, Julian, for the question and for the person who asked the question about whether or not um, KJAC can be considered a, a kind of early Chinese legal transplant. So I think legal transplant is a, is, a, is a concept that's familiar to us in comparative law. It's sort of the the, the, the go-to kind of concept to understand these changes. If we think of or define legal transplant as the moving of a ruler system of law from one country to another, um, then I would say that, that KJAC actually probably does not meet that definition. Now, I have to qualify that by saying that I do think the initial rules, the early rules of 2015 were very much absorbing uh, the arbitration rules of, of SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, actually, which was kind of the model. 
But then it was discovered that there were all these issues, again, between the uh, Chinese arbitration regime and, and the UNCTRAL one, interim measures, emergency arbitration, mediation by the arbitration tribunal and settlement mediation, negotiation, facilitation were all differences. And for that reason, they shifted to the 2020 rules, which is essentially kind of devolved system, which allows each arbitration uh, commission or center to abide by its own rules. So the transplant was kind of frustrated, if you will, um, through that revision process. So I think uh, to date, we haven't seen too much legal transplantation in terms of Chinese outbound uh, related work. Um, there's been some suggestion in the in the legislation for special economic zones uh, outside of China that uh, Chinese experts had been involved in the formulation of some of these uh, regulatory um, and normative documents in Vietnam, Sri Lanka, and elsewhere. Um, but these have also encountered various issues as well, uh, based upon the the host state legal system, in particular constitutional review, and in, in these sorts of checks. Um, I, I think I'll end on the note that um, it's important to observe that oftentimes it is the legal experts in the host state that are doing a lot of this work in terms of modeling Chinese uh, legislation or regulatory approaches and less a kind of overt uh, dominant or, or you know, Chinese uh, centered push. And I think that's really important to observe that it's oftentimes more the pull than, than the push that's that's doing that work. But to date, we haven't really seen too much transplantation. So thank you. Big thanks, Matthew. Um, ben, if you just want to have a few words, I think that would yes, be the very a, last. Uh, yeah. a very hard question, but I should say that the uh, importance of the RCEP is a market access commitments made by the uh, participating uh, members. So the old BIT will play a role, but uh, uh, in terms of market access, RCEP agreement is most important. Then together with the MF1, I think uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for China, compared with its partner of the BRI countries, mainly China is an a, a investment outbound uh, invest host state. Uh, not a host state, but an outbound investor state. So uh, the impact of this uh, market commitment, market access uh, commitment, will not have huge impact to China uh, for uh, the BRI partner countries, except, uh, except for the members of ASEAN countries. This is my uh, first impression. I'm not sure that is correct or not, but I have to reflect over this, over this issue. It's, it's interesting. In any case, it was great to have you talking about the asset uh, yeah. today because that's part of the, that's part of the broader scenario. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I initially wanted to have a second round of questions, but I don't see any further questions and we're getting close to the end. I will just want, I would just like to ask a very simple question to the three speakers. Three, because Susan had to leave. She had another commitment. Um, what is in one adjective, um, uh, what is the, sorry, what's the, the one adjective you would choose to describe the future of law and BRI, if you think about that, and to conclude on a short and perhaps positive note, what would be that adjective? Can we, can I ask um, Matthew, ask. then UN, and Bin? Yeah. Uh, uh, I would, I would like, one one adjective and a positive one. I'll end on a positive note, and I would say uh, adaptative. That's my word. Thank you. That's a great one. Thanks, Ewan. Uh, I'm not that positive, so I would say uncertain. Uncertain, <laughs> noted. And for you, I like I, I like you a very uh, uh, in fashion word soft. <laughs> it is <laughs> not that soft. <laughs> Okay, that's a nice one too. Okay, a lot of uh, food for thought on that. So uh, it's 5.59 in Hong Kong. The organizers asked me to close on time because everything is recorded. So we are perfectly on time. Uh, excellent. I truly enjoyed this panel, uh, really. I'd like to thank again our speakers, the, the four speakers, for their very interesting and stimulating contributions. Thanks thank also you. to the participants for the valuable uh, questions. We got quite many questions that led to a very good discussion. So it's time to, to close this EU plans uh, panel webinar. 
thank you all and 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 goodbye everyone thank you bye-bye bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Just, Bye. just one last question. Um, can I share your slides with our students afterwards? Yes. Yes. No okay. problem. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julian.